Juan. Thanks, Juan. Appreciate it. Yes. Well, good to be with you. We were actually last weekend in Boston, so it feels good to be home. Uh, really cool story. God uh, opened a door for us to go up there and minister to a leadership team of a church, about 30 leaders, and their community um, positioned in Cambridge. So it's literally two minutes from MIT and 10 minutes from uh, Harvard and, and, and Boston College and all those kind of places. It was really interesting. Position, think about this. Uh, Harbor plunked right down in the middle of, of this area of Boston. That's, that's the community that we were a part of up there. It was awesome. And what was so fun was to see people that had doctoral degrees um, from Harvard or MIT or all these places, high intellectuals that loved Jesus and just really wanted to see God do something in their city. Because Boston's a tough place. It's not, it's not a, a vibrant area for God right now, but man, with these people in the city, it was so encouraging to see. So, so glad to be with you guys. Can you believe it that tomorrow is Palm Sunday and the next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and that's when we're going to be having Harbor's uh, Easter gathering, or we call it Resurrection Weekend on Saturday night, so we'd love to have you come back. But invite a friend. Invite somebody else to come hang with you. Um, that's a time when a lot of guests will actually come to church and be a part of a meeting like the one that we're going to have. And if you have kids, we are having a, a children's uh, thing happening at 4 o'clock. So just for your awareness, that's going to be taking place from 4 to 5. Um, fun activities for the kids, and, and then we'll We'll go into our gathering at 5.30, so it's going to be a great time. Was any of that up on the thing? Nope. Okay, so just look it up on the, on the website, um, 4 o'clock next, next Saturday, and then 5.30, our Easter gathering. So I want to just uh, dive right in tonight. Um, with it being uh, Palm Sunday, I actually didn't uh, really think about my message as it related to Palm Sunday, but I actually found myself um, in John chapter 12, verse 12, which is the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. But my mission tonight, if we could all, by the grace of God, lean into what Holy Spirit may want to say to us, is to leave here this evening with a little greater understanding of the shalom of God, which is the peace of God. Could you guys say that with me? The peace of God, all right? So we're going to lean into that. And actually, there's been a theme here, as Juan mentioned, even from our team meeting until now. I think God is is up to something, so I'm really excited about just bringing the word of the Lord to you. Really honored to be a part of a great team of communicators um, to share this with you. So let's jump right in to Matthew, I'm sorry, John verse, chapter 12, verse 12 and 13. And here we have it. It says, the next day, a great multitude. So there's this momentum, there's this movement of momentum happening that had come to the feast. So it was Passover, it was a Passover season. And when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, it says in verse 13 that they took palm branches, which represented goodness and victory, to come out and meet him. Now, you've got to remember contextually, the Israelites were expecting a conquering king to come and make his way into Jerusalem and deliver them from their adversaries militarily. Okay? So the transformation that they were crying out for because here they are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And they cry out and they say, Hosanna, which basically means save us. Have you ever been in a moment where you're like, God, please come right now and save me. You know, from this fill in the blank, whatever's going on in your life. And this was a moment where they were at and they were looking for this military king to come in and conquer which is really an external reality. It's like coming in and driving out all their enemies. And how many of you know that Jesus was up to something totally different in the way that the people just didn't understand? Some years ago, um, our staff, our team at the time, was gifted a trip to the Carolinas, and the, the, it was an all-expense kind of paid thing by this guy whose daughter had really gotten touched deeply by Jesus. And he said, hey, listen, I have a place up there. I want to make sure you guys can go up and I'll pay for your tickets to get there and your food while you're there and some fun activities for your team. You guys pour out. I want to just give a time back into you. And one of the things on our agenda was a white water rafting trip. Has anybody ever done white water rafting? All right. So this was on the trip. Now, what was happening as we were getting ready to go and, 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 you know, 
to the place where we were going to be put in the boat and dropped into the river and stuff, we, we found out that it had been raining all day and the river had swollen to a height that it had actually none of the guides who had been there for years had ever seen it be that high. The river was just raging, you know, and they were actually getting ready to shut down um, the, the, the rafts going down the river because it was getting a little dangerous, you know, and some of our team, I mean, this is just the personality of our team at the time. We were like, no, like, please, like, we want to go down this, you know, the, yeah, the bigger the better, like, let's do it, you know. That's kind of where we were at at the time. I'm a much older now. I would never, <laughs> never be in that position again. But the guys were like, listen, it's, 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 it's not like, it's not even safe when it's normal river height because there's this rapid, and they, they were briefing us on this rapid that is called the Eye of God. Okay, you can look it up. Google it. The class five rapid called the Eye of God. And the reason it's called the Eye of God is it's a rock underneath the surface of the water that has a hole in it, and the hole creates this turbine effect of the rapid, and you can't take the raft through the Eye of God. Because if, God forbid, it flips over the raft and people fall out of the boat, they get stuck in the turbine and they get just, they get just taken round and round like this, washboarded through the thing. And there's actually, this is really intense, but there's been people that have gotten in that place and got stuck in the hole in the rock. And they, they can't get you out, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like they can send a diver down and, like, get you out of the hole in the rock, okay? So this is what they're debriefing. We're like, yeah, let's go, eye of God, yeah, the eye of God, you know? So, you know, that's, that seemed great until we got in the river and, and the class one rapids were now class five and the class two were like class, you know, whatever. And the class five was like death staring us in the face, right? So as we made our way down, you know, our, our, our raft guide, he kept saying, okay, we're coming up on the eye of God. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to be positioned over here. And then I'm going to tell you, row. And when I say row, everybody row like your life depends upon it. That's what he said. So, okay, all right, we'll just, we'll, we, you know, so we're, I'm just, there's this anticipation building as we're making our way down the river, right? And so I want to show you a picture. What happened before they put that up? Hold it, wait a minute, put it, put it back down again. So before this happens, we get in that, that point of no return zone. And he's like, row. And then he gets a little more intense. Row, because he's, he's been doing this for a while, and he's seeing that we're not actually getting out of the current that we're not supposed to be in that's going to suck us right into the eye of God. And then I hear this cry from our, our, <laughs> our brave uh, guide on the, on the trip. He's like, Row like your life depends upon it. And he's yelling out, and he's just saying it over and over again. And so we are rowing, we are all rowing. And, it, it, and, and we come to this place, and then I want to put this up, where we realize this is right where we're at. He's, we're realizing that we're going to go through the eye of God. It's like game on. I want to show the second photo, because I want you to see the look on our faces. <laughs> Can you see this? Michelle, who's behind Justin, she's like, oh, no. You know, Justin's got his game face on. He's like, we're going through the eye of God. Mary Catherine's like, I'm going to die. She's the one next to me on the right. And I'm looking at this thing, and I'm thinking, man, this is not good at all. So when we go down through this thing, it is wild. It's, it, it was, it, you get just, you go right down in it, and then I swear the wall of water up in front of us was like 10 feet tall, and I'm in, I just kick, the adrenaline kicks in, and um, Mary Catherine, who's right behind me, flies up, and I just, just hand-eye coordination, just quickly grab her literally out of the air and pull her back into the thing, Justin hangs on somehow, but by the time we get through the eye of God, Michelle's out of the raft, and so is our guide. And I'm thinking, God, save me. You know, I'm in this moment where I'm trying to save everybody else because we don't have a guide in the raft anymore, you know? But I'm thinking, I need saved myself. We survived the eye of God. 
But this, this was a moment that we see here in the life of Israel where I think there was a desperation. They saw what was coming. They were getting sucked into it. There's nothing they could actually do. And they're looking for someone to come and deliver them and to save them from the experience that they're in. But look at verse 14 with me, because this is where a total curveball gets thrown. It says, Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy, which is actually found in, where is it here, Zechariah 9, 9, where it says, look, your king is coming, riding on a colt. Now, we know historically that kings that conquer, they don't ride donkeys. Can I get an amen? They don't come in on a donkey if they're a conquering king. This is a very humble, when I was young, I, I think you guys, most of you know I was grow, growing up in Montana. My uncle was actually what's called an outfitter, and he would take very wealthy people on these big extravagant hunting trips for elk and bighorn sheep and stuff like that. And so one summer, during the summers, he would often take us up as a family into the, to the Wyoming wilderness, the high country of, the, of Wyoming, which was awesome. And we would fight over the coolest looking horse, you know, because there's something about having that best looking horse, you know, as you're, as you're riding up into the mountains and stuff. And here Jesus is coming on this little donkey. And here's what John says in verse 15. He says, this is what I want to focus on. He says, don't be afraid. And then he references the ones who he's speaking to by saying this, people of Jerusalem. So he says, hey, don't be afraid. And he calls them the people of Jerusalem. Now we're going to see in a minute that Jerusalem means city of peace or city of shalom. He says, look, your king, he may not be everybody's king right now, but your king is coming riding on a donkey's colt. Now, can you see with me here two massively significant references in this Zechariah 9, 9 prophecy? And the first one is, and I want you to catch this tonight, number one is the place that we all should call home. That's the first thing I want you to see. Jerusalem is the place that we should call home. I'm not talking about literal Jerusalem, okay? I'm talking about the city of the shalom of God, the place where we call home, the place that we should be dwelling, the city of peace. Psalm 127, 7. Quickly, I just want to put this up. It says, O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. So there's actually a call to pray for the shalom of the city of God, which is where we dwell, okay? We can't move, all move to Israel. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about us dwelling in a place, a place that we call home, where our hearts are safe in that place, in this place of shalom. And the second reference is to the one that we call king, the king of peace, or the king of Shalom. Look at this with me in Hebrews chapter 7. There's many scripture, scripture, hey, (laughs) scripture references. That was tongues and interpretation. Can I get an amen? Just was hey, that was the interpretation, okay? It says, then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek in the name Melchizedek. This is talking about pre-incarnate Jesus is called the king of justice and the king of Salem, which means the king of what? Peace, the king of shalom. So we, our home is the city of shalom, and our king is the king of shalom. But what is shalom? That's the question. Because there's all kinds of different, you know, definitions that we could come up with, and what is shalom? Did you know That shalom is not just the absence of conflict, but the presence of a state of well-being. Oh, man. It is well with my soul. 
Because conflict, you see, conflict is gonna, it's gonna, I just wanna just, I wish it would all just go away. Because the people that are into peace and hope and love, they're just, no more conflict. And which, which that's a righteous cause, right? But what do we do when conflict continues? In our own hearts, in, in our families, in, in what's going on around the world? Are we gonna come into a place um, that's not just an absence of conflict, but a state of well-being in our soul? This is what God is after. Peace in the Old Testament, you can study this out on your own, is the the word shalom, which I've mentioned. And in the New Testament, it's irene. Write this down. Shalom is a state of completeness or wholeness. The reference here would be like a stone wall with no gaps, with no missing bricks, if you will. It's like it's all set in place. So when, when that wall is, is around you because you're in the shalom of God, you're in a com- place of, of completeness. You're in a state where there's no lack. There's no access that's able to get to you in the way that it once did. You know, when David, King David, who was a king, he was a warrior, when he asked his brothers on the battlefield, how were they doing? He asked them, how is your shalom? Think about that. So they're in this conflict, and the question of David to these warriors was, how's your heart? Is it in a state of well-being? Are you in a place of shalom, a place of peace? Well, this king of peace named Jesus came to bring us shalom to make us complete or to restore all things that are broken. This was his mission. This is the mission that he's been on. It's the mission he'll continue to be on. In fact, Solomon, I just have a few little thoughts here for you to think about. Solomon restores or brings shalom to the unfinished temple in 1 Kings 9.25. He comes and he brings completeness to the temple that was unfinished. Think about the symbolism here of what God is doing with us through process. You know, back in the day, Old Testament, if you damaged your neighbor's possessions, you would shalom them by restoring what was lost, Exodus 22.4. So if you killed one of their animals, you would bring shalom by buying them a new one. So whatever was hurt, whatever was harmed, whatever was broken, there would be shalom by making things right, by restoring your neighbor with what was taken to them based on your own fault. Proverbs 16, 7 says, to reconcile or bring restoration to a broken relationship. Everybody say relationship. (laughs) Relationship. is to shalom that relationship. To bring a state of well-being to the relationship that's been broken. How I many of you know we could have a little bit of that in the world today? Come on, somebody. And, and this is really interesting. When rival kingdoms would make shalom with each other, it, just, it didn't mean that they just stopped fighting. They actually started working together for the other's benefit. Can you imagine two opposing kingdoms come into shalom and they don't just stop fighting. They're like, hey, what can we do together to benefit, mutually benefit one another in our journey continuing forward? Here's the thing. Leading up to Jesus, all of the kings of Israel were to cultivate these things in the world. Did you know that was a call over this nation? And yet, It rarely ever actually happened. I love Old Testament prophecy. It's so powerful. Because Isaiah prophesied that a prince of peace, oh, come on, or a prince of shalom, whose kingdom of peace or kingdom of shalom would have no end. No end to the restorative process of God in the earth. It would continue in power, moving from glory to glory. And it would right all wrongs 
and heal all that had been broken. Did you know in Romans 5.1, we see the start of this where it says that Jesus made peace or shalom between us and the Father. That's the first thing he did. I'm gonna make restorative peace between you and the one who created you. This is what happened. If you look at John chapter 14, verse 27, and you can look at this later. I don't know if we'll have it up. There you go. Jesus says what? Peace, I leave you. Peace, I give to you. It's, it's the Irene word. Not as the world gives it to you. Let your heart not be troubled or afraid. Wow. If I could have Keneal and the team come back up. What is the, the single greatest hindrance in our lives to maybe seeing the fullness of shalom come, peace, true peace? I think it's going back to where we started tonight to understand that we actually are called to live in this reality. It's the thing that the world doesn't understand, the world doesn't get. And when we walk in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, people go, what in the world is going on inside of you that I don't have? You know, Wendy and I, we love creating an order of righteousness, we kind of call it, in our home. We like everything in, in its place. We like it to be a clean, presentable environment. We don't like stress in there. But, you know, you, you, try, to, you try to bring that out into the world, and you're going to overflow in those kind of ways, right? But there's still going to be conflict. So how do you manage that? How do you handle that when you're in the midst of the chaos? It's knowing that, listen, even though I'm out there immersed in this world that's filled with conflict, my home, my physical home, if you will, where we create this shalom, now goes with me because I never exit this place of living. And oftentimes we can get so rattled when we're trying to navigate this space and all we see around us is conflict. We're looking, we're looking for some resolve. Like, what king are we putting on the throne to try to find some sort of resolve in the natural? Is it the king of Shalom? Or is it some other king? The king of binge watching the king of two bottles of vino at nine o'clock. The king of what, you would like that one? Okay, so Tom, Tom's gonna get saved again tonight. Come on, somebody. He was loving the vino. But there's this king of peace that has come. But can I tell you, I think the biggest reason is we're trying to hold on to our life and we need to let go. We're just like, I want to live. I don't want to get destroyed. I want to just hold on to life. We try so hard. I want to show you the, a, a verse as we close tonight that, that comes right from the lips of Jesus. And he says in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 16, he says, if you want to hang on or try to, which is impossible to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And I love the Greek word here, it's sozo, which means to make whole. Shalom.
mean, this may sound like a bold statement, but I believe that the greatest thing that we can have operating in our life is the shalom of heaven, the peace of God. I think it'll be one of the brightest lights that shines in the day and the hour that we're living in. Are we going to have financial challenges? Are we going to have conflicts relationally, betrayal? Are we going to walk through difficult circumstances? Unfortunately, Jesus says, in this world or the system of this world, you will have trouble. But take hope. I've overcome the world. I believe he resides as he did on earth, now in heaven, in a state of shalom, in a state of wholeness. This my friends, is our portion tonight. Could I just take a minute and could I just ask for the king of peace to come and create a city of peace, a walled fortress in our hearts. This is where we're to live. Spirit of God, Spirit of the King of Shalom. Thank you for your nearness to us tonight, Lord. That outside of your grace, enabling us to live in an otherworldly city under an otherworldly king, we refuse to try to hang on to our life. In fact, you gave up your life, Lord. They waved palm branches and they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Come and give us goodness and victory. But that only came upon your resurrection when all things that had brought brokenness to earth, death, hell, the grave, now it was conquered. And you reign even this moment in a state of perfect peace. Release it from the inside out of our hearts, God, for your glory. Just before we leave here tonight, could you just think about for just a minute, where has the enemy been tripping, chipping away at your peace and you've just been fighting to hang on? Where has that been? And could you just, in a sense, wave that palm branch tonight and say, God, would you come to me? riding on humility and servanthood, meekness and love. And would you meet me here tonight in that place and would you come and would you do something that I can't do in myself? just going to have Keneal and them just close with a song and you're dismissed. If you have kids in the nursery, would you please grab them, Children's Church, and then you're free to come back in. If you need some space before God tonight, just take as much time as you need. But thank you. Thank you. The peace is what you came to give us, Lord. Have your way. Have your way. Come and minister tonight, in Jesus' name, to all the needs in this room. Because you already live in the city of peace, and you're already under the rulership of the King of Peace. Receive his benefits tonight in fullness. In Jesus' name.